This is the sixth installment of the Crash Course series in Regions Chemistry for the Kinetics in Equilibrium chapter. And we're going to start with potential energy curves and all the implications this understanding has, okay, with table I and other concepts. So let's start with the potential energy curve. All right, and very, very important that we know the parts of the potential energy curve, but also being able to apply it in reactions. So in my y-axis, I'm going to have potential energy. Okay, this is not temperature, this is not average kinetic energy, potential energy, and this would be some kind of uh, time coordinate. Okay, and how it, we're going to measure the potential energy changes of a reaction over the span of how a reaction occurs. Okay, so let's start with um, the reaction here, and this would be Let's make my reaction, I'm going to write it above here as, um, I don't know, uh, A plus B goes to C. Or let's make it even nicer, AB. Okay, so it's a synthesis reaction, let's say. Individual elements forming something, okay? or it's going to be a redox reaction, but it doesn't really matter. In any case, what we have here is we have the energy that A and B already have. So this would be uh, the potential energy of A and B reactants. Okay, and it's very, very important you understand that this side of the equation, okay, is the reactant side. These are the chemicals that react that form the products. That has to be clear. All right, so we have our reactants becoming products. Very important that that's established. They react to make products. Now, right here, right now, this line of potential energy is the potential energy of the reactants. This is how much energy, potential energy, the reactants have. Okay, so that line right there. Now we can put a number to that if you'd like. We'll put that a hundred. So we'll call it a hundred joules. Why not? Okay, now the reaction is going to proceed in a certain pathway. And the pathway of potential energies looks something like this. Now at the end of the reaction we have the potential energy of the products. So we have A and B down here. Okay, and you notice they collectively have less energy than the reactants. So this is the potential energy of the products. And the products have less energy. And we could make this line, the best that I can draw here, uh, equal, let's say make that 30 joules. So we started with 100 joules of energy that the reactants had after the reaction uh, proceeded and went to completion and stopped. We have 30 joules. So what happened? Well, clearly, okay, we lost some energy. And energy was released. How much? Well, about 70 joules of energy. This is an example of an exothermic reaction, okay, or an exothermic curve. Now, exothermic means that heat or energy is exiting. Has to be. The energy is going down. So when you see a potential energy curve, one of the first things that I teach my students is to see where you start and where you finish. Evaluate whether it's an endo or exothermic curve. This is clearly exothermic because I'm starting high and I'm finishing low. Another way to evaluate that is in terms of stability. Okay, you should know stability, okay, is dependent upon energy. All right, so these A and B, because they have higher energy, potential energy, compared to the products, they're unstable. Unstable is very important to understand, that it's high energy. 
These have high potential energy, which means they're going to eventually possibly do something with that energy. If I have reactants that have high potential energy, it should make sense to you that these things probably burn or possibly explode. So uh, unstable high energy kind of goes together. Think of that person you see that's unstable. They have high energy. You want to run sometimes. I don't know. Any case, now we're going to make products with low energy. Okay, if these have low energy, these are stable. Now, why? Well, if you're stable, you're going to stay in that position unless somebody adds a lot of energy to change it. So when you're stable, you stay that way. That's what stable means. Stable people are consistent. You can count on them. A and B is going to stay in that position. Why? Because it's got strong bonds. Okay, why? Okay, we can see that because to break the bonds, we would need this much energy. And we'll talk about that. So stable compounds. So exothermic reactions produce unstable things that could burn or explode, and they produce things that are stable, okay, which means they stick around. Case in point, let's go to table I for a second. Now the top part of table I has combustion reactions. We have these organic fuels, these or carbon-based fuels here, reacting with oxygen to make CO2 and water. Well, guess what? Who's unstable? These reactants are unstable. These are all burning, okay, reactions. This is octane, this is gasoline, propane in your barbecues, natural gas. These are all combustion reactions, all burning. So these things are unstable. That's why they're used as fuels. They have high potential energy. We make CO2 and water. And CO2 and water are stable. When you go to the beach, you don't see a cavern. Let's go to the beach and see the empty hole. No, you see it filled with water. Why? Because water is stable. It stays around. CO2 is stable, and for good reason. CO2 has got to get to the what? Got to get to the plants to convert the CO2 back to uh, oxygen. You better have that oxygen. So in exothermic uh, reactions, the products are more stable than the reactants. You can memorize that, or you can understand that. Now, there's different components of this curve that are very important. The first part is identifying if it's exothermic by looking at the size of energy between reactants and products. The second one, in my opinion, okay, is evaluating the energy released or the change in energy. And we do that from where you start to the top of the hill. So we're going to start where A is 100 joules, and we come down to 30. And as I said before, 70 joules was given off. And the energy change okay, went down 70. So we're going to say a negative 70 joules, it went down. And we call this change from where we start to where we finish the change using the delta sign. Oops. Okay. Using a delta sign that you probably have seen in math. Okay. And we're going to call that the change in heat. Sometimes you'll hear it called enthalpy. So the difference of where we start and finish is that heat of reaction, enthalpy. It's got a couple of synonyms. And it's negative because we started high and went down. Why did it go down? Because energy was released. So if something is exothermic, its delta H is clearly negative. Energy was released. Okay? And we can see that in table I. And there it is. You know combustion reactions burning are exothermic. Heat's given off. And look at the delta H here. They're all negative. They're all negative. Now, these values for these reactions are per, in this case, one of these. If someone was to ask you how much energy per, let's say, 0.5 moles of methane, you would take this and divide by 2. Now, notice the 2 here. There's two octane or gasoline molecules. Okay? If they wanted the energy per 1 mole, I'd divide by 2 here. If I wanted it per 0.5 moles, I divide by 4. You do a ratio here. So this is the energy per this compound. And look at the stoichiometric values. This is per 1 because there's a 1 here. This is per 2 of them. So if they, if they asked for a per mole, you have to be pay uh, particular attention to what these stoichiometric values are. Now, if you forget that delta H is negative in this table, well, um, if you scroll down, you'll see that the bottom of table uh, I has tells you delta H 
based on molar quantities represented in the equations, right? But represented by the numbers I showed you. And a minus sign indicates exothermic. So they give you that value. Okay, what else can we relate here? Well, this negative 70 sometimes is written in the reactions. And it's very important you understand that. So let's get some things out of the way here. It's clear that these are the products. Okay, uh, now what I'm going to do is put the energy in. I know that 70 joules was released. We would put that 70 right here. Sometimes I'll put the heat here, but look at the energy. The energy's on the product side. That means we're producing heat or heat was lost. So anytime you see energy in the product side, it means it's exothermic and the delta H is negative 70. People get these kind of questions all the time where they give you this right here and say, okay, what's the delta H? And people say, well, it's positive 70. No, it's not. It's negative 70. 70 joules was produced from the reactant, so now it's lower. So that value right there really means that the delta H is negative 70 joules. Okay? Now, if the heat was on the reactant side, we would have a what? An endothermic curve, which would look like this. Okay, which is the opposite. All right, so if we have an endothermic curve, the same reactants, we're going to start low because our reactants, which, by the way, if I'm going in the reverse, the reactant is AB, okay, and we would follow a pathway, and we would wind up, okay, with our products that have more energy than our reactants. Very important. And that difference, if you haven't uh, already uh, guessed, okay, the difference in where you start and finish is going to be positive 70. So my delta H here is equal to positive 70 joules. And if I write the reaction the opposite way, okay, I'll write it below it because I can, I have AB going to A plus B, and the heat would be 70 joules on this side. I need the energy. Energy has to be added to climb the ladder. Okay, so that's a big difference. If something is exothermic in the forward, it's endothermic in the reverse. The number is the same, but the sign switches. Back to table I. So if I look at this synthesis reaction of aluminum and oxygen into aluminum oxide, very exothermic. If I do the reverse and say, hey, what's the decomposition of aluminum oxide? You would say positive 3351, right? The opposite sign. If I said, hey, what's the decomposition of NO? And you would say negative 1A2. In the reverse, you just flip the sign. Now, I could ask you in this reaction, giving you a bunch of reactions, which of the following choices has um, the products having greater energy than the reactants. I implore you to draw a potential energy diagram. So if you look at this reaction, hey, positive delta H means the energy is increasing, going up. It's an endothermic curve. This is the difference between you, where you start and where you finish, okay, is going to be this value here. So the difference between here and here is 182. And clearly the products have greater energy. So these types of equations, you need to draw, draw, and draw. Okay, so we haven't finished all the parts of the potential energy curve, but we've talked about the implications. Energy on the product side, exothermic. Energy on the reactant side, okay, endothermic. Draw these curves out. You know what they mean. Now, we have some other parts of this uh, curve here. We know that the maximum energy it takes to make this reaction go, the energy barrier is called the activated complex. Okay, it's the point that there's a, a basically a point of no return for the reaction. So in order to get to that position, once we get past that position, the reaction goes. So it's the highest energy position called the activated complex. It's kind of like A and B are just about bonded. It's a complex, okay? And there is some repulsions before they actually bond because of well, electrostatic uh, repulsions of electrons on the outside clouds of these things. Remember, in order for reactions to occur, they have to collide. So that's the activated complex. Now, the activated complex is linked to this 
right here. In order for A to B to react, they need energy to get to the activated complex. So this is activation energy right here. So this is the activation energy of the forward. I always say where you start to the top of the hill. And I always give the analogy of a slide. To ride a slide, you got to get to the top of no return, and then the slide goes and the reaction goes. So the activation energy is the energy to climb the slide. So you have enough energy, but you need some more to climb the slide. In the reverse reaction, this would be the activation energy of the reverse. Notice there's a lot more. Why? Because we're dealing with something that is stable. Something stable needs a lot of energy to become unstable. Okay? So those are the forward and reverse activation energies which is the difference of where you start to the top of the hill. You want to ride the slide? you got to get to the top. Delta H or enthalpy is the difference of where you start and where you finish. Now, there's a couple. There's one definition that pops up, and it goes by, um, you know, sometimes a question where people like, how do I know that? Do I memorize that? And they'll say the delta H is equal to the potential energy of the products minus the potential energy of the reactants. People say, well, why, why is that something I have to memorize? You don't. Okay, if delta H wants to become negative, I want to show that energy is going down. Well, don't I, don't I want to take a small number minus a big number? So if this is 30, right, we're just going to use this chart. If this is 30 and I subtract it by 100, don't I get negative 70 for my delta H? So we picked by convention we created this formula of potential energy products minus reactants so that we would get a negative value if our slide goes downward or our potential energy goes downward. And we'd also get a positive value, right? If this is now 100 minus 30, we get positive 70. So we created this basic definition so that our numbers make sense by convention. All right, and that's potential energy in a nutshell or a classroom or a uh, no, video, okay? Now, again, the implications are very, very important with table I. Now, um, let's finish off with our last implication. Something that is exothermic, we have established that heat is being produced. The temperature of the environment has to go up. You're burning something, exploding something. That means you have some kind of reaction that's giving off heat. So therefore, the environment's temperature is going up all the time. Table I. Bottom part of table I, I have salts dissolving into ions. And when they do so, we have either a positive enthalpy or delta H, which means endothermic, or I've got exothermic, negative curves, negative values. Energy is going down because it's released. So I have two values here. Well, when I dissolve potassium nitrate in water, I get these free ions. It's an electrolyte. It's soluble because of group 1 ions. But because it's endothermic, because its energy is going down, I'm sorry, because it's going up endothermic. Okay, That's why it's good to draw these, because I'll make the mistake like possibly anybody else would. Endothermic means energy is going up, because why? You're absorbing it. So you're taking energy from the environment to make the ions have more energy. So this takes energy from the environment. So if you've got a, uh, a beaker and you've got the chemicals down here in a little reaction container I'll just make, these are going to take energy from their environment and they're going to make the solution colder. Anything that's endothermic makes the environment colder. An ice cube, you should know an ice cube, all right? is melting from a solid to a liquid. Why do we put it in our drinks? In order for a solid, which is structured, to become a liquid, which has more energy, it needs energy from the drink or your hand to melt. So it takes energy from the environment, and a solid going to a liquid is endothermic. Okay? So that's understanding that things that are endothermic make the environment colder because they're taking energy from the environment. Okay, and people get confused here, but the point of reference is who's responsible for the energy change. People will say, well, Mr. Grotsky, if something is taking energy from the environment, isn't that something who's giving it exothermic? So what do I do here? Easy to remember, guys. Who's responsible when you put an ice cube in a drink? Who's responsible for making the drink colder? The ice, because the ice is doing what? The ice is absorbing energy. Who's responsible for making your house warm? Who's responsible? The fuel that you burn, 
okay, in your house at night, okay, whether it's diesel, fossil fuel, natural gas, wood, okay, we burn some carbon-based fuel to make our environment temperature warmer because heat's being released. So if you have these salts that are exothermic dissolved in water, guess what? The temperature of the solution goes up. If it's endo, they go down. Okay, one another implication is strength of bonds. Okay, if I want to compare um, two compounds here, let's find something that's, that's nice to look at. Um, let's look at NO and NO2. Okay, and if we look at NO and NO2, we all see that they're um, having two in front. So this is the energy per two of them. So if you wanted it per one mole, we would divide by two. But since they're both two, I'm just going to leave it alone. Okay. Now they're both co uh, classically endothermic, starting low and going high. Okay. Now, who is more endothermic? NO is positive 182 and NO2 is positive 166. So if I was to draw a potential energy curve, I would see the difference between starting and finishing is here, and the potential difference between starting and finishing is here. And when you think about it, strength of bonds of the products means how stable they are. If it's a strong bond, they're very stable. So if you think, generally speaking, the less endothermic I am, right, the lower this line which means the more stable and low energy. So NO2 has stronger bonds. Now it's easy to see, and if I was probably doing this, I should have picked an XO and endo to compare. Like for instance, look at ammonia, okay? Uh, I know that the two here, divide by two, you get that 40 something there. Now, if you look at ammonia, okay, it's exothermic, which means its products are what? More stable in its reactants. Look at C2H6, that thing is what? That thing is, endothermic. It's going up. So who's going to be lower? Okay. Obviously between the two, the exothermic is going to have more stable products. So the more exothermic you are, okay, and I think I was choosing C2H4 there, so sorry. The more exothermic you are, or the less endothermic you are, the more stable these compounds are. So I can express the stability of bonds with how less endothermic I am or how more, how more exothermic I am. So if I was to compare these two, so let me compare um, these two values from table I a little better, a little clearer. A good, a good explanation here of what I'm trying to bring across. Any case, I have two uh, synthesis reaction where I'm giving the delta H's right here. And I know their values. They're both negative. They're both exothermic. Okay, and if I was to draw their exothermic curves, and, be, and before I do that, I want to evaluate this 2 here. This is the energy per 2 moles. So if you want to compare these values, you have to find it per 1 mole. So I'm going to take this negative 91.8 and divide by 2. Okay, and I get 45.9. Kilojoules. Okay, so I'm going to compare negative because it's still negative. Negative 40, let's put it over here, negative 45.9 with a negative 84.0. I'm not going to touch this one because this is already per mole. So delta H's are per uh, molar quantities, and that was per two of them, so I wanted it per one. So now I can compare. Now, if I was to draw a potential energy curve for these two compounds, and let's do um, the making of ammonia first. Okay, we'll see the delta H here is negative 45. And if I do another compound, let's do the uh, C2H6, which is our ethane, right? F2 carbons, that's definitely 2N, uh, CN, remember CNH2N plus 2, right? So that's definitely an alkane, so ethane the making of ethane. Um, who knows where I start, but let's pretend it's a very similar place. But this is going to be lower. Now, why is it lower, generally speaking? Because it's more exothermic. The difference of where I 
start and finish is going to be greater, negative 84.0, whereas um, the other one I did here, okay, is going to be smaller, negative 45. I'm not drawn to scale, but you get the point. So we can make an assumption that something that's more exothermic when it's formed is going to make more stable products. And if you're stable, that means you have strong bonds. Bonds exist because they want to use each other to become stable. We learn that bonds form because normally they achieve what? Noble gas configurations, right? Which are stable, low energy. And to think about this for a second, the energy it takes to break the bond is the reverse, isn't it? So what's the value here? The lower that you are here, the more energy it takes to go in the reverse. So something is stable, low energy, okay, it takes a lot more energy to break it. So stable is the same thing as strength of bonds. So we can evaluate stability of bonds and strength of bonds by how more exothermic we are when we form something or how less endothermic. Okay, so now we're going to go into equilibrium and some uh, equilibrium basics, okay? And we're going to know that at equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse. Now, when I say rate, I mean the speed at which A and B may, A and B in, uh, individually make AB the compound. So we're going to say that as fast as A and B come together, a and B decompose. And if that is true, that we are replacing uh, AB as it's being lost, or the AB is being replaced by the AB once it's decomposing, then that means that these guys would stay constant. So what's equal in equilibrium is the speed of the forward and the reverse. And because of that, the amount of each stays constant. The classic example I've been talking about in these videos is that tank demonstration, which I have um, linked, at least I have at the bottom of my crash course series in the folder of my website that I did for my class this year. And if you did a tank demonstration in class, you notice that when we, when we added equal amounts of water to each tank, then equilibrium was established not when the tanks were equal, when these lines stayed constant. Case in point, if I've got two people on this line and I've got four people on this line and a single person changes lines every minute, the people are going to change. That's why you hear the word dynamic. But because one person replaces another one person, right, the number on these lines stay constant. Right, so the rates are equal, and because of that, the concentration, its brackets, of the products and reactants have to be constant. The tank demonstration, the line stayed constant. Think about a line of people, four people and two people, and one person from each line switches every minute, you're always going to have the same number. Things are changing, but the amount of each Reactant, if you think this line is the reactant and this side is the product side, stays constant. Very important. Now let's take a little detour here. We talk about rates. What affects the rate of reaction, the speed? Well, you should know, to, in order to have a reaction, you have to have an, a collision. Now I should say an effective collision because there are collisions that are not effective. Now what's an effective collision? There are two requirements. Number one, you have to have high kinetic energy in order for the two atoms in this case to overcome their repulsive electrons on their outermost clouds they're going to repel so when they come together they have to overcome their negative negative repulsive forces in order to bond that's really called activation energy and number two they have to have proper orientation right I mean, there are some compounds, not really atoms, but there are some compounds, especially bigger molecules, where their bonding sites, think about ammonia, it's got a lone pair, okay? And the only way that ammonia can accept a proton is if the proton hits that lone pair. So orientation is the collision has to occur in a certain part of the molecule. So high enough kinetic energy, 
and of course correct orientation makes an effective collision. So the bottom line is the rate of reaction increases if the amount of collisions increase. And if the amount of collisions increases, okay, just by statistics alone, the number of effective collisions increases. What are the factors that affect um, the rates of reaction? Well, anything that affects the number of collisions. First and foremost, you guys should know temperature. Temperature makes a reaction go faster because molecules have now more motion energy. Remember, temperature's average kinetic energy. So their kinetic energy is high enough and it raises this value. Okay, a catalyst also speeds up the rate of reaction. A catalyst lowers the activation energy of my potential energy curve. It creates a whole new pathway and that pathway lowers the energy it takes to start the reaction. If I want to ride a slide, if you tell me the slide is lower, I can get a lot more rides in in a time period with the same amount of energy if it's a smaller slide. So if you give me 10 minutes and say, go Mr. Grodzki, how many rides in that slide can you make? Well, I'm going to get a lot more rides in if I'm climbing a smaller okay, uh, energy cost to ride the slide. If my slide was higher, like this is the what? Non-catalyzed reaction. Okay, it would take a lot, lot more energy per ride or per collision. So I would have a lot less rides in the same time period. Remember, rate is about time. Okay, so lowering the activation energy, that's what a catalyst does. It, it makes a whole new pathway that increases the rate of the reaction. Notice something, it does not change the difference in where you start and where you finish. So delta H stays constant. It only changes this hump. So I tell my students, when you add a catalyst, what you're doing is medicating this hump. So if you got a pimple or a blackhead or something raised up, you medicate it. So a catalyzed reaction is medicated and it's lowered. Uncatalyzed is higher. That may help in a weird sense. I'm not sure. So those are that's how a catalyst affects rates of reaction. Notice it doesn't affect delta H. And a catalyst does not affect equilibrium because it speeds up the what? The forward as much as it speeds up the reverse. So a catalyst has no effect on equilibrium. Now, what are the other factors? Well, concentration. If you add more dancers to a dance party, there's going to be more collisions for the same uh, same dance floor. So that'll also increase the number of collisions, which will increase the effect of collisions. Surface area. If you take a powdered form of a metal, it's going to react fa faster because there are more atoms exposed for more collisions. Think of people dancing in a dance party that dance in a circle. If they dance in a circle, only the outside okay, dance partners can be hit by the other particles. They're protected. A log on the fire is not going to burn as much as sawdust. Sawdust is explosive, as I showed you this year in a demonstration. That's also up on the website. Okay, so surface area we've talked about. Nature of reactants. Here's the one that people forget. If I have an ionic compound, ionic compounds react faster. Now, why? Well, ionic compounds, okay, are nothing more than a positive and a negative ion in close proximity. And if I give something that is more positive than what this is attracting, it'll just move toward that other positive. Or if I give something more negative next to this positive, it'll move. There's no transfer of electrons or divvying up the electrons. It's just who is more positive, who is more negative. Now, you should know to make something ionic, electrons were transferred to get to this position. We're not talking about the making of ionic compounds, just ionic compounds in general. A negative and positive... Hey, you're like magnets. You put another stronger magnet there, it just goes. It's going to be faster. Something covalent, oh my gosh, you've got electrons you've got to divvy up. So you've got to figure out who gets whose electrons. It takes a little longer, so ionic compounds react a little faster. So I've got temperature, catalyst, concentration, nature of reactant, surface area. And the last one is pressure, but this is only for gases. If you have a, a scenario where a gas is a reactant, well, two gases will be pushed closer together if the pressures are higher. So therefore, the um, collisions will increase and therefore the rate. Now, there's another type of equilibrium. There's two types. There's phase equilibrium and there's chemical. We've been talking about chemical, but let's review the other phase equilibriums. 
Okay, phase. How about we have an ice cube in a cooler? This is the best cooler of all time. No heat gets inside. Okay, made of non-metals because they're good insulators, right? Okay, so I got my ice cube. We know it's endothermically melting, okay? But this water is at zero degrees Celsius, and we know at zero degrees Celsius we are at a phase change where solid and liquid can what? Both exist. Look at the connections, people. Remember, solid, here's my liquid. Solid and liquid at the same temperature. It's a phase change temperature, okay? So what's going to happen here? Well, there's going to be some melting, and believe it or not, there's going to be some refreezing. So we're going to have H2O solid melting into H2O liquid. This is a phase change. This is physical. Okay, but you're also going to have some liquid going back into solid. Look at the double arrow. So the rate of the forward equals the rate of reverse. And what did I teach you? Well, the amount of each stays constant. So even though this could be an ice cube of perfect square or perfect cube, over time, when we come back 10 years later, assuming no heat got in, which is impossible, but hey, uh, so is making these videos. <laughs> in any case, um, the shape's going to change because I'm going to have some remelting in different positions. Something's going to uh, melt, something's going to refreeze in a different position. So this is probably going to get rounded over time. But the amount of ice, if I started with a one kilogram block of ice, okay, I'm going to have one kilogram block 10 years later because the rate of melting equals the rate of refreezing. Now, another one that's probably more common to you is if I have a bottle, okay, bottled water. Okay, certainly this is no bottle. You probably have up water, but hey, and we stopper it. Okay, well, the rate of, guess what? Evaporation equals the rate of condensation. And you have, let's say, H2O liquid is in equilibrium with H2O gas. Oops. All right. And the rate of what? Evaporation equals the rate of condensation, which means the line and the bottle stays constant. You guys know a stoppered bottle, if there's no hole, the amount of liquid stays constant. Hey, you knew that, right? So that's why it stays constant at equilibrium. Okay, now we have something called solution equilibrium. Solution equilibrium is where, we, of course, we have a solution of dissolved and undissolved particles. So here I have a, uh, let's say, a container. All right. And I have some undissolved solute particles on the bottom. Okay. Now, in order for this to be equilibrium, I have to have my solids make it NaCl. Solid is in equilibrium, double arrows, with its ion, NaCl aqueous. Okay, so this is a solution, homogeneous solution. So the rate of dissolving, that's going this way, equals the rate of what? Reprecipitation, right? Making it precipitate. So the only way this works is if this solution is saturated. Okay, think with me for a second. The room that you're in, let's pretend 100 people can exist. There's two openings. If I jam somebody in, if it's already 100 people in there, somebody has to be flown out because I'm saturated. Well, think with me here. If this is saturated and all of a sudden I jam one of these solids into aqueous, well, then one of these aqueous are going to be forced back out through the other door into a solid. So this only works when it's saturated. Now, if this wasn't saturated, okay, think with me for a second. Let's get rid of the box. <laughs> Didn't mean to do all that. But if you think with me, here's my box, here's my two arrows, and now I don't have it saturated and I throw one person in, well, no one's going to come out. So if this wasn't saturated, we'll see if I don't take away too much stuff, uh, too late. Uh, if it's not saturated, okay, then what I have here is I, the solid, which now is floating, okay, can just what? Start dissolving, and you're not going to have any backwards motion, and you're going to have what? The rate of dissolving faster than precipitation, and you no longer have equilibrium. Okay, so that's that. Now, chemical equilibrium. So it's important you understand that's saturated. So chemical equilibrium, okay, is where we're pretty much now going to talk about Le Chatelier's principle. Now, I have a nice lecture on Le Chatelier's below, but I'm going to quickly go over it. Now, Le Chatelier's principle is based on a reaction at equilibrium. A to B makes C and D, okay? And when I teach this or talk about this, I think of stress and response, Okay, the stress is what I put on this reaction that's at equilibrium, double arrow. 
the response is what their reaction does to respond out of equilibrium. I've got a person, let's make uh, his body connected, okay? As you can see, I'm not very talented in drawing, okay? Uh, his arms aren't connected, but who cares? Uh, any case, this person with only two eyes, okay, gets pushed by somebody else. Well, he'll fall down unless he pushes back in the opposite. That's the key here. I'm going to push you, you'll fall down, but to prevent yourself from falling down, you push back in the opposite direction to regain your balance. So that's what's happening here. We're going to give the reaction some stress, and it's going to do what? It's going to go in the opposite and respond by doing that. For instance, if I add too much A, okay, and think with me for a second, I got a nice seesaw, and all of a sudden I add too much A, or I put Mr. Grotsky on it, okay, what's going to happen is, this big A is going to send whoever's sitting here into a s small Earth orbit. Okay, it's unbalanced. The unbalanced is seesaw. We've got to lower A so that this seesaw can rebalance. So, so if I have too much A, I have to lower A, or the reaction is going to respond by regaining its balance by lowering A. So if I have too much A, what the reaction does is it shifts to the right, which means it goes faster in the forward than reversed which means A gets lowered to regain its balance, so B has to get lowered because A and B are getting used up to make C and D, and you make more C and D, okay? That's one stress. Now, what if I took A away? If I decreased A, well, now the reaction's going to shift to lower or make more A to do the opposite, right? It's going to regain its balance. You took A away, it's going to shift in the reverse reaction to make more A. And if you think with me for a second, if I take A away, B has nothing to react with to make C and D. So the, forward rea the reverse reaction is going to be faster. And what happens is C and D get used up if it's going in the reverse faster, and we're going to make more B and A. These increases and decreases are always the same on each side of the reaction. They're on the same team. Okay, so that's another stress. Okay, and let's add some heat here. Like we talked about, I'm going to put the heat on the product side, which is an exothermic reaction. So let me increase the heat or the temperature. So if I increase the temperature, you can guess what's going to happen. We're going to lower the temperature by doing what? By either making more heat or using up the heat. Yes. We're going to shift to the left to lower the heat so that the reaction can regain its balance. Therefore, C and D go down, and B and A go up. Now, so your teachers might have had you memorize that, hey, when you increase the temperature, you always favor the endothermic way. That's fine, but I don't think you have to memorize. All you have to do is understand, okay? We have too much heat, it gets lowered. So either I'm going to make more, that doesn't make any sense, or I'm going to use it up to regain my balance. Yes. The reaction does not want to be pushed over on the ground, neither to you. So let's learn this. Okay? Now, uh, if I, of course, lower the temperature, put it in an ice bath, the reaction wants to make more temperature, so it will favor the exothermic way, make more heat. And these guys go down. Again, if you're not quite getting all of this, please look at my other lecture that I have, okay, on the Shetler's principle. Now, the last, or second to last, is what if these were gases? A and B were gases. I know I got it crossed out there. Okay, and now I'm going to add pressure to the mix. Now, like I said with the reaction rates, pressure is only affected by gases. So if you have no gases, there's no effect. And if the gases are equal on both sides, there's no effect. Let's increase the pressure. Can you guess what the response is going to be? Decrease the pressure. Now, when you hear pressure and these types of swinging out of equilibrium problems, the Chatelier's problems, count moles of gas. There's two moles of gas on this side. There's zero moles of gas. So my friends in chemistry, if I increase the pressure, the reaction to regain its balance is going to lower the pressure by shifting to the side with less moles of gas. There it is. Okay, and A and B get used up. They go down. And we're going to make more C and D so that the pressure gets lowered. Pressure is due to gases colliding. So you're going to shift to the side with less moles of gas. If I was to decrease the pressure as my stress, it would shift to the side with higher moles of gas to increase the pressure. Case in point, you're constantly surrounded by things that you know of. You know that when you open a soda bottle, we know we have CO2 aqueous, right? In equilibrium 
with CO2 uh, gas. That's in a soda bottle. You have the CO2 that's dissolved and it wants to come out. Now when you open the soda bottle, the pressure is what? The pressure is lowered. So if I make my stress down here, let's get rid of this. If I make my stress down here, lower the pressure, I open the soda bottle, count moles of gas. This has one, this is zero. What's the response? The response is to increase the pressure. How does the reaction regain its balance? By making more moles of gas or less. It's going to make more moles of gas. And you know that when you open a soda bottle, you see the bubbles come up and leave and the soda goes flat because the reaction's going to, or the process I should say, is going to make more moles of gas. And the reaction shifts to the left. The CO2 aqueous, the solubility drops when pressure drops. And this is showing you that solubility of gases drop when pressure drops. And you make more of this. It's that you're surrounded by this. So that's Lachatelier's principle in a nutshell. Now there is occasionally something called a common ion effect. For instance, if I have uh, Pb chloride in equilibrium with my ions, okay, two chloride ions, if I was to add sodium chloride to this, I know sodium chloride breaks apart into Na plus and Cl negative, I would be really increasing my chloride concentration. And the reaction would look to what? Regain its balance by lowering it, and I would force the reaction to go this way to lower the CL because I'm adding a common ion. So that's Le Chatelier's principle. If you want more, please. I spend a lot more time on it on my individual. Okay, last little piece here is entropy and completion reactions. Okay, entropy, by, by the way, is nothing more than disorder. It is a lot more than entropy and thermodynamics than we teach in this course, but here's some basics. Okay, this reaction the entropy going forward is increasing. Now, entropy, think of chaos. Okay, it's, del it's, it's S for entropy, but they don't use that in this course. So chaos, disorder. You need to know that when one particle breaks apart into two, there's just more disorder. And of course, if uh, two particles or more come together to make one, your entropy is decreasing. You're becoming what? Ordered. Now, classic way to look at this is phases solids to liquids to gases. Gases have what? This is a chart of energy, have more energy. So as we go up, the entropy steadily increases. Who is more chaotic? Well, gases are. Who is more ordered and structured? Solids, they have that regular repeating geometric pattern we call crystal lattices, okay? And that is essentially what you have to know for entropy. So when they ever ask what's happening in entropy, look at the reaction and see if one thing is breaking apart into pieces, dropping an egg into pieces, chaos is increasing. Putting the egg back together, okay, would be going against nature and your entropy would be uh, decreasing, okay? Always think entropy is chaos or disorder, okay? Solids have a regular repeating geometric pattern. They're very structured. So their entropy is low, but your gases are flying around hundreds of miles an hour. They have tremendous chaos, okay? And the last little piece is um, something called um, going to completion. When I have a reaction that goes to completion, in this course, it's for two reasons. If I make a gas, so if A plus B makes AB, and let's pretend that this is a gas, okay, and this may be, I don't know, a solid and a solid, okay, and the gas gets to leave, there's no, there's no way for this gas to go in the reverse. So this reaction keeps going forward until we run out of our reactants, and that's called going to completion. Another way is making a precipitate. So if I take lead nitrate, which we did in class, plus, let's say, potassium iodide, we would do a double replacement reaction. This would be lead nitrate with two, because lead is plus two. And we would make lead plus 2 with the iodine, who's negative 1, I2. And, of course, we would make uh, K potassium nitrate. And we would evaluate this as my precipitate on table F. In table F, we know that um, lead, uh, iodine is a halogen, is soluble except when hooked up with lead plus 2, silver, and mercury. So this is a precipitate. Now, what's so special about that? Well, these guys are aqueous. These are solutions. These are soluble from table F. Anything with a nitrate is soluble. Anything with a group 1 ion is soluble. So these are all soluble compounds. So they're all aqueous.
which means they have free ions. So what's happening here is lead plus two, that's free ions, hooks up with I negative, who is free ions. The nitrates are free and the K are free, really. I call these ions, you know, it's a sham that we run them together. They're really free. And what can happen is the lead finds the iodine and sticks together. It prefers each other. So what happens is it makes a solid, which means if these guys get locked up, they're no longer free, and the reverse reaction can't occur, right? These guys can't switch partners because these guys are locked up in a crystal lattice. So the reverse can't occur, and the forward reaction keeps going until we run out. If you think of Le Chatelier's principle for both of these, if you keep taking away one of the products, and that's your stress, lower one of your products, right? Uh, what does the reaction want to do? It wants to make more products. So the, the, the reactions keep shifting to the right until you run out of your reactants, and that's called completion reactions. And that essentially is the entire kinetics and equilibrium unit in 50 or some odd minutes. Okay, hope you enjoyed. Again, if you need to look in more detail, look at my instructional videos below. Thanks. Rock on.